Uh, good day, everyone. Um, I'm here again. I was here back in October and I did a webinar for the chapter on curriculum architectural design. And uh, this is what we're going to talk about today is performance analysis, which is one of the four types of analysis that I do as part of all ISD efforts, curriculum architecture design being one of them. That's when you determine the performance based needs. Uh, determine what uh, existing content you have that fits those needs, and then you architect all the gap content around the existing content so that the business leaders can prioritize where they want to put their money. Um, slides. So we're going to talk about performance analysis, and to me, this is how I anchor both instruction and performance improvement efforts beyond instruction back to the authentic performance competence requirements back on the job for the target audience, for the learners, if you will. Um, I'm going to uh, give a little background and then we're going to, uh, I'm gonna do some little demos and then I've got a couple of exercises that I will ask you to do. You'll do these on your own and then we can, uh, we can talk about that via chat uh, as we go through this presentation. Um, Let's see here. All right, so again, a little background before we start. To me, this is all about whether it's instruction or other interventions, this is really all about improving people's ability to perform tasks and produce outputs and meet all of the stakeholder requirements for both the tasks and the outputs. Um, which necessitates understanding who the stakeholders are and what their requirements are. And so this is a little model and I'll, and I'll talk about this a little bit later on. And there's a, uh, an article that I wrote in uh, 1995 that uh, describes uh, the various stakeholders. And, and I've got them in a hierarchy because um, if stakeholder requirements conflict, what we want is an easy way for people to figure out, well, who wins and, and whose needs do I meet and whose needs do I forego meeting? And it's kind of complicated uh, in the flow of work, if you will, but so we need to provide that kind of guidance to our learners. And so that's all part of this. Now, what I'm gonna talk about today is a derivative of a derivative of analysis methods that I learned when I first got out of college and took my first job at a training organization in Saginaw, Michigan. Um, and it was credited to me way back then to a guy named Gary A. Rumler, uh, who later on I got a chance to work with. Uh, he passed away in 2008, but he was a key mentor of mine and uh, I owe him greatly for what I've achieved in my career. If I make mention of the word PACT, this is what it refers to. It's what I call my ISD methodology set. So it's just my branded thing for ISD or LXD. Um, and if I refer to EPI, uh, that's my performance improvement methodology that's beyond instruction, but including instruction. So in the Venn diagram here is that uh, ISD is a subset of performance improvement. And regardless of whose methodology you're looking at, uh, that's how at least I look at it. And when I created my methodologies for doing projects, for training, developing other people to do things this way, um, I did this quite deliberately. I started with ISD, but in the back of my head as I was doing uh, that and formulating it all, I was conscious cognizant of the fact that there's more to performance than individual people's knowledge and skills. And so how do I uh, tend to all the other variables of performance? I'll talk a little bit about that as we go through this. This is the general systems model. This was created by uh, Gary Rundler and Dale Brethauer back at the University of Michigan in the, in the early 1960s. And so this was kind of central to my development as I learned about things. It's I, I take a process or systems view of things. And so this model is kind of central to this. Now, this comes from a, a quarterly newsletter that my organization did back in the late 90s. And you see very on the left there, there's the input and that flows into 
the processing system. These are where tasks happen, both be uh, physical tasks and cognitive tasks. Um, and so that's where you produce the output and then the output comes out on the right and it goes into a receiving system. So one of the things to think about is that every output is an input downstream and you can get feedback back into your own processing system from the output itself. You can measure it before you ship it, if you will, or you'll get feedback from the receiving system, the recipients of your outputs downstream. When I publish this, uh, Gary Rumler said at the time, oh, I, I screwed up. I forgot to, there's a different kind of feedback and I should have included that in that. So number six in the numbers at the bottom of the graphic there would be consequences. It's a, tip, it's a type of feedback, but if you ship poor outputs that become poor inputs downstream, there may be consequences to that, such as they quit ordering from you. They don't do business with you anymore. And so that's another feedback type, a specific type of feedback, in just not data, but there could be positive consequences, more orders or negative consequences, less orders or zero orders going forward. Anyway, so this is kind of central to my performance orientation. Something else that impacted me greatly back in 1981 when I joined Motorola is I came across this, the Ishikawa diagram. It's also known as the cause and effect diagram, the fishbone diagram, many different names for these kinds of things. And this is the, uh, the 1980 version of this thing with the uh, four Ms, it was sometimes called that, the four M model, men, materials, methods, and machines. Of course, men would be people nowadays. We're not so uh, uh, male centric in these kinds of things. But this was created by Dr. Ishikawa who was a professor back in Japan in the 1950s. And so this was part of the quality movement of uh, post-World War II Japan. Now I've taken this and made this very complicated as you can see here, and I'm gonna to get to a simpler version of this in a moment, but you can see I've changed the orientation from left to right to be more of an upstream downstream orientation in terms of outputs as inputs flowing into the next process box, if you will and then continuing the flow. And there's all sorts of feedback and consequences. That's what the little FB and the Cs are, if you can see that in the screen that you're looking at this on. And so, so the, and there could have been more arrows to that. And it could, I could have made this even more complex because the world of performance, the world of processes, the world of workflow is quite complex. And so I'll take a couple of steps here to get this a little bit simpler. Okay, that's a little bit simpler without all the feedback and consequence loops in that. And what I wanna to get to is this notion of a process or processes, however they're bundled. When we look at, well, what are the variables for performance that we'd wanna understand and look at as we're trying to improve that or maintain that we need to look at the process itself. That's one of the things I learned from Rumler is that the first thing he looked at is not the human being and we need to train him and you take every training request and the first thing he would focus on is, so is there a process? And if there is, is it adhered to? Does everybody follow the process? Yes or no? And if not, why not? Because what he found is that most problems in workplace performance were due to the fact that there wasn't a process in the first place. It's an informal process. Everybody's doing it every which way. Uh, lots of variability in that. Lots of issues in, inherent with all that variability. So that's probably where you might want to start is fix that first. The second thing that he taught me to look at were the environmental enablers, what I call the environmental asset enablers. But uh, one of my phrases here is adopt what you can and adapt the rest. So some of this language is maybe old school, we'll change it for your performance context and make it uh, resonate with, with your audiences. But in, within all those environmental enablers, the data and information, the materials and supplies, I'm sorry I'm reading this to you, some of you may have small screens and can't see it, but there's tools and equipment, facilities and grounds, budget and headcount and culture and consequences. Well, he taught me to look at the consequence system to see, are we punishing good performance? Are we rewarding poor performance? And that's the second thing I would look at after looking at the process. Do we give good performers extra work to do? 
And do we give less work to the people who aren't doing very well because then we just have to do rework or whatever? So what's the consequence system in place here that drives performance? And that's part of the culture, how we do things around here, what we accept, what we tolerate, what we won't accept, what we won't tolerate. That's all part of the culture and consequence system as I've labeled it. Again, change the language here to, to meet your needs. Um, and then at the top of the fish bone, if you will, are the human asset enablers. So what do the humans bring to the performance process party, so to speak? Well, they bring awareness, knowledge, and skills, and they bring their physical attributes or capabilities. They bring their psychological attributes or capabilities, and they bring their intellectual attributes and capabilities, and they bring their personal values. So either all of the things that the human brings and has is conducive to the process, is adequate to the needs of the process, or does not. Now, most of us in the ISD instructional design kind of business, learning experience design, we're focused on those awareness, knowledge, and skills. But there's other variables to performance. And so when we're doing our projects, hopefully we're given the opportunity to do analysis before doing design, before doing development, or whatever framework or model you use. Um, but we need to understand, so what's required? Because if we're, I have another phrase here, and that is all requests for training should be, for new hires, should be expected. All training requests for problem solving should be suspected. What Gary Rumler found and what the, uh, the late guru, uh, quality guru uh, W. Edwards Deming found was that most performance problems are not due to the individual and they're not due to their lack of knowledge and skills. It's due to other variables. And there's a whole bunch of different models, somewhat similar to this, maybe look a little bit different with different wording. But basically, that's, that's what we want to look at is that we want to look at, well, so if we've got a process problem, then we need to figure out, well, what are the root causes beyond the symptoms that we might be looking at or given information about? We need to really look for what's at the root. And it's more likely going to be more than one root cause. Um, and so we need to have some sort of a framework uh, to do a diagnostics of, of all of that. Anyway, so this is my model. This is central to what I do when I'm doing performance analysis. I want to understand that process, the, the performance of the process, and then that leads me, once I have that really clear, and that's what we're going to talk about today, I can then do some sort of a systematic deriving of all of these other enablers. We're not going to be talking about that today, but that's where this leads to. So this is just one part of the type of analysis that I do in these kinds of projects. Um, and uh, Maybe you'll have questions about that as we get that a uh, little bit further into this. Um, so now I'm going to shift gears here into, so what are the outputs of performance analysis? So you'll see some uh, larger uh, graphics of these here. So this is just to set this up here. But I'm trying to capture performance analysis data. And what's really critical about the data is its integrity, which to me is, is it accurate? Is it complete? And is it appropriate? And I'm trying to make sure that the data that I capture that's going to lead to me looking at the other enablers, that I have this part accurate and complete and appropriate. So the, the first thing we do is we chunk out the performance. Now, I call these things um, areas of performance. In, in the world, uh, since I've been in this business since 1979, these things are also called major duties key results areas, accomplishments. There, there's a lot of different language for this, but chunking is, is, a, is a term that maybe you're familiar with. And I just happen to call those chunks areas of performance. What I had found is that those other labels all carried nuanced meanings to various people as I was trying to do my analysis. And I was kept on getting caught up in, you know, that's not how that works, guy. So, <laughs> To avoid all of that, I just said, I, I got this thing called areas of performance. You don't know what it means. I do. And so let's just get going and chunk out the performance. Now, this is important to segment performance, just like a marketeer would segment their target audiences in the marketplace. I'm trying to segment the performance and capture it holistically at a high level. 
I want to capture that at a high level so that I can then take each chunk or area of performance and then do some detailed data gathering around that. And that's what these performance model charts are that we'll be looking at in just a moment. These capture the key things such as the outputs and the tax, tasks and the gaps and their causes. So here's the large uh, picture of that. This is actually based on some work that I did in the mid 1980s for a convenience store that was a part of a gas station operation. And it was a new thing back then. Those of you, you're probably too young, uh, most of you to know that. All you older people like me will say, oh yeah, I remember when gas stations started selling you know, everything like a 7-Eleven uh, uh, did, because that's who they were competing with. Um, but anyway, so this was how this was chunked out, staff recruiting selection, work scheduling, progressive discipline, store operations, customer service, inventory management, doing all the payroll, banking, financial kinds of things. This is how the master performers that I was working with, this is what they kind of came to consensus on. This is how we would chunk this out. And then the acid test that Guy brings to when we think we're getting close to being done, is there anything, any performance, any outputs and tasks that, don't, that you do in the job that don't fall within one of these buckets? And if this covers everything, then it does. If it doesn't, then we determine and define another area of performance. But that's what this is. Before I go deep on anything and gather a whole bunch of micro data, I want to make sure that I've got the waterfront covered, that I've got a, a framework here that will allow me to capture everything apart that's part of this job. Of course, just because the group concedes that, oh yeah, this covers everything, you know, as you're doing the analysis later on, you may discover that, oh, oops, there's another bucket here we forgot to mention, and we're going to call it whatever, and, and then you continue going. What you're trying to do is make sure before you start going deep, because that's is mentally wearing on people um, that you've 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 got this set. You you really it's uh, it's important to do that before you start going deep. And by going deep, I mean I'm I, I capture this kind of data on a format that I call a performance model chart. And again, I've been doing it pretty much this way since 1979. I've done hundreds of consulting engagements doing this. This is all part of it. Uh, as an outside consultant, you know, when I bid on a project or respond to a request, I this is all part of my project plan, and this is all built into the price for doing it. And so everybody, they let me do analysis. I fully appreciate that sometimes you can't do analysis overtly. You have to go covertly. You have to find some way to figure out, so what the heck are the big chunks of the job? What are the key outputs and measures? as part of that chunk. And so the column on the left, beginning with the end in mind is, so what is the output of staff recruiting selection and training? Well, this was the first page of several pages for this area of performance. And one of the outputs was, hey, you got new staff hired and it's gotta be timely and qualified. And I've stripped out some of the other measures from the, from the original work here back in the eighties. Um, but so that's, that's one of the things you got when you're done, you got a new person. And what are the tasks that you perform to get that new person hired? Well, you, you can articulate and capture those tasks. And these tasks are kind of at a macro level. They're not at a micro level. They're not every nth degree of all the tasks that you would perform. This is just the high end of this. And that's what I tend to do when I do analysis. I don't go really deep here. I'll go deep when I do development and fill in the gaps and extend these tasks into all the little micro things, all the decisions and discriminations that somebody has to make uh, uh, in their head cognitively, rather than what the physical behaviors are that we can see and observe. So my purpose at this point here is to gather enough data about this performance, the outputs, the associated tasks, and then in the middle, there's, there's the roles and responsibilities. So who's doing what? Who's doing that first task? Who's doing that second task, uh, et cetera, so that I have some task clarity, some role and responsibility clarity as to who's involved with this performance. And so I'm working generally with master performers and other subject matter experts capturing this as they say. So this is what we come to a consensus and agreement that, yeah, this is what we do. And of course, every last individual would say, well, I do it a little bit differently, but you know, yeah, that would work too. 
And so that's the issue when you're when you're working with a group of people and you're trying to get them to agree that, yeah, we need to train everybody else on how to do this. So the next part, the next, the right hand side then is the typical performance gaps, the probable gap causes. And people have often said to me over the decades, Guy, why don't you use root causes? Well, I don't have all the time in the world to do this. I am usually have a set time that I'm working with people to capture this data here. I don't have time to ask why five times or ask so what five times or whatever method you want to use to get down to the root cause. I want to know off the tops of the heads of the master performers that I'm working with. So what causes these gaps? And I also want to trick them, trap them, into saying that some of these gaps, causes, are due to a deficiency of knowledge. Some of them are due to a deficiency of the environment or the environmental supports. Some of them are due to other individual attributes and values. And so I, I'm trying to get them to see that, oh, training can solve some of the problems, but not all of them. Um, so what we see here on the left-hand side, this is what I call ideal performance. If I've got master performers saying, yeah, this is how we as a group of master performers, this is how we do things, or this is close enough, this will work. Then I want to understand what the performance gaps are against that ideal performance. And we're going to talk about this a little bit uh, in a moment. Here is another example. This is also from the 1980s. This is an account representative, so salespeople, if you will. And I worked with a group of folks to basically chunk out the performance, these area performance, major duties, whatever you want to call them. Um, and that led then to looking at the details. So here was territory planning. Um, not surprisingly, one of the outputs of territory planning is a territory plan. And here's the measure that's got to include all this other stuff. Again, I've simplified this a bit. And then here are the tasks, four big tasks, if you will. And the salesperson is doing this on their own. The account rep is doing this on their own. So there's no other roles and responsibilities. It's just them as the lone ranger doing their thing. And there are typical performance gaps. And what I ask the master performers is that, so um, are there gaps in the performance? Are are there problems with these key outputs and those measures? And if so, what are they? And they tell me the plan is incomplete or the plan is not adhered to or updated when changes occur. That's the problem, guy. Oh, so what are some of the probable causes? Well, they don't know how to do it, which is a deficiency of knowledge. They don't take the time, which is a deficiency of the environment. So they may know how to do it, but they don't have the time to do it. Or again, it's not demanded by management you know, we're not going to fix some of these things by training the account rep. There's other factors at play. There's the culture and consequence system at play that are at the root of probably or probable gap causes. And so now we're getting a picture of ideal performance and some of the gaps and some of the reasons why we have gaps. And this is very Socratic, if you will. I'm tricking everybody, including my client, into become, becoming aware of the fact that training ain't going to solve all of their problems. Now, if the reason we're doing a project is because they have a bunch of new hires, and of course, they don't know much of anything. They may know some things. They may have some prior knowledge. But basically, then, then we, why would we capture typical gaps and probable causes, Guy? Because we're not trying to solve a problem. We're trying to train new people. Well, I believe and have practiced that not only do I need to train the new people on here are the tasks and the outputs you're going to produce. Here's the barriers that you're going to uh, face along the way. Here's the, some of the gaps that are going on already. Here's some of the causes. So when I, because I'm working with master performers, theoretically, they avoid these kinds of performance gaps. They get the job done, and somehow they're able to anticipate and avoid a gap, a problem, the root cause, or they know how to recover quickly. So one of the things I'm using this gap analysis data for is to figure out how do I train people to avoid these problems in the first place, and what do I teach them how to recover quickly in the second place if things were unavoidable? 
performance is more than it's simply one, two, three, boom, you're done. It's one, two, three, and oh yeah, watch out for that you know, rock falling off the cliff here and step aside. Um, so we've got to train new people in what, their, what the real authentic performance context is, which includes sometimes barriers to their performance. So it's not easy one, two, three. It's it, sometimes there's a lot of difficulties and maybe it's not all the time, maybe it's just random, but they've got to be trained. They've got to learn how to anticipate these problems and look for these kinds of problems. And so this is my way to capture all of that. And I don't have all the detail in the world here because after I do my analysis, I'm going to do some design and then I'm going to develop the content. And that's when I've really got to get all the, the to the nth degree detail about how to avoid these problems, how, what, how to recover should they be unavoidable. Now, so here's a little demo here before we get to a Q&A portion of this. Um, so I've, I've used the term instructional experience designer here because you know I'm trying to be young and hip. But um, so it's pretty much the same thing in my view as what good instructional systems design has always been about, but uh, that's a conversation for another time. So guy would ask somebody, I have a blank page in the front of the room on a flip chart. That's usually how we do this. You can do this virtually too. We'll talk about that at the end of the session. Um, so what's the one big chunk of the job? I would ask a group of instructional experience designers. And they might say, well, we do instructional design, just like the job title says. Oh, okay. And so I start, I place that in the center of the page. And then I try to figure out where to go from there. And I usually go, so what do you do before that? And we'll talk a little bit about that. But so the idea here is to capture that and then we're gonna detail out that part of the job, instructional design, and you're gonna identify, so what are, what's, what's the key output from an instructional design? If you're in that chunk of the job when you're doing an instructional design, what's your final output? Well, sometimes it's called a design document. Okay, so we can write that down. And I'm not using words here because I want you to conceptually grasp this. I might say, well, how do you know a good instructional uh, design, a design document from a bad one? And people would tell me. And so I'd write down the key measures using their wording, their language, not messing around and changing it to noun, verb, or verb, noun. I don't do that. I capture what they've said. Um, and if you know, two or three people verbalize it a little bit differently. We try to come to consensus on some acceptable wording that they can all subscribe to. Then I ask them, so what are some of the tasks that you perform here? And I try to get, get this in a linear flow and figure out the first task, the second task, the third task, you know, what are all the tasks that are required to perform to produce that design document that has those measures? And then I wanna know, so who's doing what? What are the various roles involved in this? There's an instructional experience designer. There may be an instructional experience design manager. There could be the vice president. There could be the key clients. There could be a whole bunch of people in the sandbox of performance. And I want to know who's doing what? Where do they? Where does the interplay come in here? Because that's part of what I need to train people or that's what I need to figure out is maybe who we're looking at isn't really the... the where the training needs to happen, maybe we need to train other people to do their jobs better. So, and then we want to again go to, so if that's ideal performance there on the left, so what are some of the gaps? What are some of the probable causes? Which of those are deficiencies of environment or knowledge and skill or individual attributes? And I have a fourth one now, process deficiency in the process. That's part of the newer version of this thing. Um, and so we try to capture that. And then we say, are we done? Is that pretty much it? And either it is or it isn't. And you continue working this or basically you move on to the next chunk of performance. So now Rosa is going to field the questions and give them to me so that I can try and answer anything that you have. Yes. And in the chat, so she's doing that for me. Yes, please pose your questions in the chat and then we will direct them to Guy. Uh, Guy, I, I love what, you're, what you've said so far, and I'm actually one of those people who can, uh, because of my uh, young age, remember when gas stations <laughs> started doing those things. Uh, so I'm right there with you. Uh, and I love the quote that you, um, that you said about um, 
you know, all uh, training for new hires should be expected and everything else suspected. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on, on that, you know, um, regarding that other training as we wait for a couple of uh, questions? Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer that new people coming into a job, most likely, not always, most likely don't have, don't understand what the job tasks are and how to do it and how, what they got to produce and what the measures are, you know, how does the world look at this? And I, with measurements, there are formal measures. It's what the corporation, the enterprise says, this is how we measure things. And then if you ask a master performer, they're going to tell you, oh yeah. And some of those are, you know, we don't even pay attention to them, guy, because there's other measures that are even more important. There's, so there's an informal measurement system behind all of this stuff. And if I'm going to train people to be successful in their jobs, I got to know what the formal measures are. I got to know what the informal measures are so that people can win at the game of performance. So, so it's so, so you should expect a training request to come in for, for new hires. Yeah, of course. Duh. But when a pre problem, when a training request comes into you because there's a performance problem and somebody needs to solve it, however they articulate it and label that, that's got to be, you got to be suspicious of that. Now, that doesn't mean that you should rebuff their request and say, well, are you sure it's a training problem? I mean, I learned from the, the late Joe Harless back in the mid 80s uh, that, that not to do that. He was tired of people, you know, saying, oh, you shouldn't be an order taker. You should just push back. And he thought, well, that's just bad practice. Um, we should say, sure, I can help you. And I can help you even more if I can do a little analysis and basically get to what are the performance requirements? What are the gaps and what are the causes? So that we can make intelligent decisions about how to make investments for improvement and maybe training will be a part of that, and maybe training won't be a part of that. But so that's kind of where all this comes from. And so I was oriented in that kind of a performance orientation, very of, you know, training's not going to solve anything, instruction's not going to solve everything, learning's not going to solve everything. So how do we begin to look at that and work on behalf of our clients, our customers, mm -hmm. and help them improve the performance? And, Do you have any uh, questions or should I go uh, on? No, we, we did get a question. Um, and thank you for that. Um, the one thing I have as a sign in my office is, you know, in God we trust all others bring data. And <laughs> I, I think as, um, you know, designers and performance improvement uh, practitioners, sometimes we have to go out there and find the data ourselves and, and right. help get to the root cause. So one of the questions posed is, do you work with the company uh, contact to identify who those master performers are um, that then you engage in the process? And then also, are there usually significant performance problems before you are brought in, such as staff being on uh, PIPs, or is it uh, more of a group or team performance issue? Well, that second question, it's, it's, it's more varied. Uh, I get brought in a lot to address needs of new hires or new processes that have been, uh, you know, processes that have been reconfigured or brand new lines of business and things like that. So it's usually because people are new or the process is new and therefore people working in that area, it's all new to them. So, but sometimes there's, there are performance problems and I've had big, huge projects. I had a project back in the late nineties $750,000 that got canceled right after the analysis phase because I was able to show my client, it was Verizon, that uh, training wasn't going to solve any of these problems. You have a world of issues here, and it has to do with the fact that most of the time there are no processes. So people are out there trying to get things done, and there's tremendous variability here, and that's you know variability in process produces variability in products. Those products are outputs that are inputs downstream and the people downstream are unhappy with you. So you're trying to fix things by training people. And, you know, I saluted and said, yeah, I'll take this on here and I'm going to do a little analysis. And so the whole project got shut down after, the, after the, I was finished with analysis and I have a gate review meeting with my client, my stakeholders, and they could see via the data these charts, you know, I capture them in that same format. I report them back out in that same format. They looked at this and go, well, all those DEs, training is not going to solve anything. We need to somehow get rid of Guy because we don't need him to do the training here after this. We need to stop this project and go fix our processes. 
And it was kind of funny because I could see that coming and I knew that that was the right answer. So yeah. because I, I assembled my client into a project steering team, because um, I want more than just, you know, the requester, I want all the key stakeholders, because usually if we're going to do something, it's going to be of significant investment. So I need to get as many people uh, who are key stakeholders, you know, the, all the vice presidents of sales, all the regions, you know, that kind of thing here so that they could. And, the, and then I use them up front to answer the first question. I use them up front to identify who are the master performers? Who do we want people to emulate? You know, I come from the Chicagoland area. So, you know, if we're going to train people to be, you know, do basketball, we want them to be like Mike, Michael Jordan. So who are the best of the best? We want to work with them. We want to capture what they, their, their knowledge, and, and we want them to help us identify what's ideal performance. And because master performers generally know why other people aren't master performers, they can help articulate the gaps and the causes because they see that typically nobody pays them to call it out and try to fix it. They're just doing their own thing, you know, as, as a master performer or exemplar or top performer or star performer. Again, careful with the language because some language works. It gets tricky. Yeah. And others don't. Right. And, and sometimes they're either trying to mentor those other people or fixing the issues caused by the other people. Right. Um, so here's another question. Um, it says, I much appreciate avoiding the root cause analysis to avoid eating up your time with the client. Uh, but they're curious whether anyone ever asked for it or if they say yes, if you do propose it. Well, so getting down to the roots, yeah, that can be a secondary thing. Here, I'm hired to do training things most of the time. Um, if we were after a, a problem and then I can't say, well, you know, we're going to be done with this analysis here in two or three days, depending on, you know, what the scope of the effort is. Um, and so therefore it's something that we can't be as predictive about the schedule and the cost and things like that. But so what my clients normally do is they assemble what back in the eighties were known as critical action teams. They'd bring in a bunch of experts here and they take guys data and they'd go work on that and get down to the root cause and decide, okay, we got to redesign the process. We got to redesign the tooling, maybe put in some electronic performance support systems. You know, the, the, the solution set can be wide and varied. And so that's kind of a break off project uh, in some cases where a guy is asked to go ahead and continue with, you know, we got a, we got a bunch of new hires, we need to train them. You've helped us uncover a bunch of issues that we have in the workplace, in the workflows. And, you know, we'll, we'll get uh, other teams to go tackle those kinds of things. But so I'm all about, yeah, you got to get down to the root cause eventually. But if I'm training people, you know, I can train them that sometimes we're not going to be able to fix the real world in any kind of a timely fashion. And maybe the costs of, of the current state are less than the fix. So we're going to live with it, guy. We can't fix everything. So teach people how to navigate that. And so again, when I get into the development, that's when I've got to give people more than what I've shown you here in terms of what I've captured. Right. Can I move um, on? Uh, that does make sense. Uh, one last uh, question. How often do you find that the uh, issue is the metrics that the client is using are not the right set of metrics? Uh, for example, cases where the metrics data being captured don't address the KPIs that the team or organization have set. And that's, that's and how pretty do you deal prevalent. with that? Well, yeah, that's that's a that? that's a client decision here. I, you know, I've I've taken their handpicked master performers, and you know, you can kill the messenger, me, but I've facilitated this group of people to tell me what the real world measures are, despite your KPIs, despite what kinds of measures you articulate to everybody. Master performers know how to be master performers. They've figured it out. And so these are the measures that they say are important. This is what guides their performance, despite the formal, formal measures, et cetera, et cetera. So that becomes an organizational issue for my client. Again, if I'm doing training, now they can decide to fix that and we'll have to update the training or so it varies, it varies, but, but it happens quite a bit. Most processes are informal, unnamed, not managed. Most key real world measures are not captured or, you know, and, that, and I'm over generalizing here because there are some places where they've done that, you know, nuclear power facilities, they've got that name, right? 
Um, but most places, not so much. And maybe they've done it on a couple of key processes, but not all the processes that a job title or a team might be working in. Okay? Yeah. I'm going to move on. Uh, yep, yeah, that was the last one. Thank you. All right, so uh, now we're talking about, we talked about the outputs. So again, that was the beginning with the end in mind, the outputs. What are the tasks that are performed when you're doing this? So uh, my little demo here is always airborne airlines. This is a kind of an exercise that I do when I'm training people on these kinds of things. Um, and this is the sky cap. So, you know, many of you haven't flown in a while. Uh, maybe some of you haven't flown much, but and maybe you don't use sky caps. With sky caps are where you drop the bag off at the front of the terminal, go park your car, come back to this and go in and, and you know get on the plane and your bags are hopefully there at the your destination. It doesn't always happen. But anyway, so there's the people that are out there collecting the bags. So it, an example here is that the so I would ask them, so to start off, just name one big chunk of the job. This is how I start. Just name one chunk here and they say something like, oh, we tag bags and we place them on the conveyor. I write that in the center of the chart because I don't know if this is the first thing, the last thing, or somewhere in the middle. I don't know. I just, I've captured one thing. So my next question then is, so does everybody agree that, that, yeah, part of the job is tagging bags and placing them on the conveyor? And everybody says, yes, of course. And I say, so what, what do you do before you do that? And then I say, well, you know, we clean up the work area. Uh, okay, so, and what do you do before that? Well, we obtain tags from inventory. Okay, what do you do before that? Uh, come to work. Okay, so we're not gonna include that part. So the first part of the job is go get tags from inventory, go to the work area, clean it up. Then you start tagging bags and placing on the conveyor and people say yes, in my simple demonstration here. So then I say, okay, so let's start where we, where that tagging bags. So what do you do after that? Well, we place the tag, we provide the tag and, and to the customer and give them directions to where their, their flight is at, what terminal to go to, et cetera. We try to collect a tip. And then we, you know, there's this end of ship paperwork and all that. So my point here was that you, you place a stake in the ground, you get one area performance or major duty or chunk of the job, and then you go upstream from there until you, you bump into the start of the whole thing. And then you go back to where that first area performance that you captured, and then you go downstream and you try to capture that. And then the acid test is, is there anything that you do in your job last week, last month, last year that isn't captured in the details of these chunks of the job? And the answer is either yes or no, and you go from there. So to start with the areas of performance, and when I've trained people, this is the most difficult thing for most people is to frame the performance before we go and get all the details. They would grab the first thing, tag bags. Oh, okay, let's get the tasks and the details and the measures and the who does what and all the deficiencies and all these kinds of things. But And I've seen people do it that way and uh, I would avoid that because you exhaust a group and when they're done talking about that and you ask them, so what else do you do? They go, nothing, we're done. Can we go on break now? Can we leave this meeting, get back to work? And I'm just being a little facetious there, but basically that's it. You can exhaust them. They can go so deep on something that they think they've captured it. And then, so I like to get the whole big picture down and then go to the details and then number them in a reasonable logical sequence to get everybody to agree on it. Not that that's exactly how you would train them and all that stuff, but what I'm looking for are primary workflows, tag the bags, Place the, uh, give the tag to the customer, give them direction, collect your chip tip. And you're doing three, four, and five all day long. You're cleaning the work area maybe once or twice during a shift. You're obtaining tags from inventory maybe once or twice in a shift. At the end of the shift, you may have some paperwork to do. You got to clean up your work area before you leave. And all day long, people can come up and ask you, they're, they don't, they're not giving you a bag, you're not going to collect a tip, but they're going to ask you, you know, where's terminal three, where's gate 47, whatever. And so you got to do that as part of the job too. It's just being, you know, customer service oriented. All right. So this is again, that example from the 1980s on the sales rep, the territory planning. So I asked, you know, so you're a sales rep. Uh, what do you do? Do you like make sales calls? 
And they go, well, we, we call it a customer call. So that's a D in this picture. So I said, oh, so that's okay. Customer call, cool. We don't have to call it a sales call, you know. And so what do you do before you do that? Well, we do planning and preparation for that call. Oh, well, what do you do before that? Well, we do account planning because as we're, we're driving around our territory in this particular case, we got to figure out who we're going to call on, you know, every time we go there, every second or third time we go to that territory, part of the territory. Oh, so what do you do before account planning? Well, territory planning came up. And what do you do before that? Uh, I don't know. You know. They didn't know. And so we said, okay, I felt like I bumped into the very beginning of the whole process, if you will, as you're, as you're framing it. So we went back to customer call. What do you do after the call? Well, there's all sorts of follow-up here, sales follow-up. Hopefully we made a sale in that customer call and we got paperwork. We got to make sure that our company, you know, we're advocates for the customer guy. And so we have to make sure that, you know, everything is going smoothly and they're going to get it on time and not damaged, blah, blah, blah. And then there's a bunch of reports, administration, there's personal development. But anyway, so this is how that group of master performers decided they would frame their world of work and all the details fell within these uh, seven buckets. Any more questions about that? This is at the top end. This is all about areas of performance before we get into the details of the performance model charts. And uh, everyone feel free to put your questions in the chat. Or raise all right, so hand. I'm gonna move on Rosa because we're, we're getting short on time because Guy talks too mm -hmm. much. <laughs> All right, so performance analysis, the task. So I've got this performance model chart. This is a format that I've been using pretty much the same way since the early 80s when I was a consultant. And, you know, so, and I'm not going to use words here. I'm going to frame this in terms of, so name that output. We've got this chunk of the job. What is the key final output? And you know you're done with this area of performance when you've produced this output and you're getting ready then to go on to the next area of performance. So I start with the end and I try to capture that. And then of course there's, if, before you do a design document, I might have to do other outputs that you produce when you're doing design, if you will, going back to the earlier example. But but so I, I'm gonna give you one, one output here and I say, so what are the key measures? You know, is it quality, quantity, cost, schedule, what are they? You know, and the every, you know, the master performers can tell you how they're measured, what they know that they've got to meet in order to be successful, whether that's part of the formal measures or not. Then we ask them, so what are all the tasks? I try not to number tasks because invariably, if I numbered them one, two, three, four, five, somebody would come back and say, in between two and three, there's like six tasks we're missing. And so I'd have to capture all those two and then the numbering thing is all, you know, my, my charts are all messy and all that stuff. So I just bullet them. Later on when we're done, well, I'll go number them when I think we're, 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 we're pretty much complete. And then I wanna know, you know, who's doing what? And again, voice of the master performers telling me, guy, no kidding, this is how it works. And if the master performers don't agree, it's usually semantics, it's usually, well, on the West Coast, we call it this, and on the East Coast, you call it that. Is it this or is it that? Well, this slash that guy would write down and go, we got it, and move on, rather than try to argue about language, because you, you can't win those very easily. So that's ideal performance. Then we would ask, so are there gaps? We look at the measures. We say, is this measure, is this an issue? Do, do the non-master performers miss this measure? Do they not meet the requirements? And the answer is yes or no. And we capture it if it is as a gap, however they articulate it. And then we say, so what do you think causes that? Why is that? And they tell us, and then we, then guy says, well, that looks like a DE and a DK or a DI or whatever, because I'm trying to get them into this notion that not everything is solvable by training or instruction or an experience. So we capture all that stuff. And the key thing here is that the measures, I have to do a good job getting those measures down so that I can identify what the gaps are. Now, what also happens is that somebody comes up with a gap and there ain't no measure for it. What do you do? Well, obviously you've missed a measure. <laughs> the group got into a group think or they were all happy that 
you know, we were getting done with that. And like a horse, they raced to the barn. And when somebody says, but there's this other gap and everybody goes, well, yeah, that's right. Well, then maybe you're missing a measure and you've got to go back to that column and you've got to capture that too. So you, this is not just a linear process. This is back and forth. And so I've made it look a little bit linear, but it's not. So don't be fooled. Uh, this is again the example here, the territory plan. It's got to meet all those measures. Here is a bunch of tasks. Here's who does what. They say the plan is incomplete. The plan is not adhered to. And here's their causes as they think of them off the top of their heads. Now, just because you can get a group of master performers to come to consensus on anything does not make them right. But who else would you ask? Where else would you start? And so this is just a starting point. You've got to be ever vigilant. You've got to know that there could be other things here that this group didn't capture. Now, I go after trying to figure that part out. What's, is, it, is it accurate, complete, and appropriate? You know, I don't know, because I don't do this job for a living. So in my review processes, and as I work with this data, I will continue to find out new things. All right, so this is, it's 1228 according to my, uh, uh, clock here, and I would have had an exercise for you, but I've talked too much, so my apologies, and I'm going to stick around for another half an hour, but some of you may have to leave, but I would have you do an exercise taking one of your summer jobs as a kid or as a high school student and take your job and then you chunk out the areas of performance for that job, and then the next part of the exercise would be doing a performance model chart. Now at the back of the uh, PDFs that were set up with your invitation to this, there's uh, what I call two ups, you know, two slides per page. Um, and at the end of the full slides are these two formats so that you could, you know, print them out if you needed to, wanted to, you don't have to, of course, but you can articulate. So for your own kid job, you know, what were the chunks and then what were the key outputs and how are they really measured in the real world? What are the tasks? Who's doing what? What are the gaps? And as a kid, you don't often know in your initial jobs, you know, who's, who's doing well and who's screwing up. And, but maybe you do. And so you can identify, well, here's some of the typical problems maybe I had when I first started. So I'll just pretend they're typical. Maybe they're not so typical. But this is where I struggled. And the cause was because I didn't know or, you know, the machinery that I was given to work with didn't work too well. The saw was dull, whatever the issues are. So there is one question here, Guy. Okay. The question is, what methods do you use to validate what the master performers offer up? Well, I take it to my... So, so there's, a, there's a couple of answers here. So I've got a project steering team. You can call it what you need to. It's where I've got my client, the requester, and the key other key stakeholders as kind of a committee. And we do a gate review meeting. We show them this data. And either this resonates with them and sounds true. They may not like it, but it sounds true because it comes from their, the master performers that they handpicked. So it's not that guy made this up saw something, misinterpreted it. No, this is what the master performers saw, said to Guy and he wrote it down in front of them and they all agree that yeah, that's right. So that's how we're part of the validation for this. Uh, but I've had clients say that, you know, you take 12 people out of a, out of a you know, a 12,000 and the N is very small, too small. So we would create analysis review teams and I've done this on several occasions where I've taken this analysis data and taken it to the various facilities where this job title reside and review it to them. And we go into a big you know, conference room and we put up all the charts and we give them a presentation and show them the whole thing and let them walk around the room and mark up the charts where they think something's missing. And we've embellished or fixed the data to make it more accurate, more complete, more appropriate by doing that kind of a review process. So again, it depends on the significance, the high stakes nature, high risk performance. You tend to want to do those kinds of things to make sure you really got it right. But I also do analysis while I'm doing design. And I also do analysis when I'm doing development. And then I went go and pilot test the content to make sure that it works, that it'll be successful. And there's, you know, 
people, what they can achieve in the training environment, and then they go back out on the job. And so you can look at, does it really transfer? Does it have a positive impact back out on the job and all of those things? So it depends on the stakes, high stakes, medium stakes, low stakes of the performance here, where you wanna really focus and make sure you really got it correct. If it's a nuclear power facility, yeah, you're gonna work at this really hard and get this right. If it's a sales environment in a retail store, uh, my client may not be willing to go to that length to, to get something out there and we can always do continuous improvement on it. But there's some cases where you just don't wanna do continuous improvement. You wanna really get it right the first time. And then you wanna do continuous improvement as the world of work changes on people. Any other questions? Uh, that's the last one in there. Um, I don't have any more. Um, uh, I guess, uh, you know, I guess if, if folks could let us know by a show of uh, hands, if they want to stay on and uh, ask additional questions or interact more, uh, maybe talk about, well, you know. Well, they can do that. Let me let me wrap up the presentation here and those who need to leave can leave and you're recording this so they mm -hmm. can do that. But yeah. um, so... So how do I, I, my preference has been since 1979 to work with groups of master performers and other subject matter experts. Now you can call them subject matter experts. That's what the world generally calls them. But I got burned in 1981 because I had a corporate subject matter expert and they hadn't been in the field for seven years. So when they helped me create training and we pilot tested it, it bombed because they didn't, they weren't current. And so I've learned to ask for current master performers, people who are master performers yesterday before we meet so that I've got the most current mastery that I'm tapping into. Now, so I do face-to-face -face meetings to gather this data on flip charts and paper the walls with flip chart pages and things like that. It's kind of like agile scrum design thinking. This is just happens to be my version of it. I've been doing this for a long time. So I, I have a facilitated group process with a team of master performers. Now I've done this virtually a couple of times, way back in the 1980s, my client AT&T had, had uh, video conferencing capabilities from conference room to conference room all across North America. And we tried it and it, was, it didn't work very well, but today what we have doing Zoom and things like that, you can capture this kind of data virtually, you can. On the right-hand side of the slide here, it's traditional subject matter interviews or master performer interviews. We can do observations. The quality of movement has Gemba. You do a Gemba walk and you go down to the real world and see what that looks like. And you can review documents and those kinds of things. But I've never felt that I could do interviews, observations, and document reviews and come away with what is really needed to understand things at a nuanced level, to really, really capture it correctly. So I prefer working with groups of master performers and other subject matter experts. Maybe you need somebody from regulatory affairs to be involved because the master performers may or may not be, you know, up to snuff on what the regulatory environment is or what the regulatory environment might change to. So there's other people besides master performers that could be involved in the meetings. There could be um, new performers, novice performers. There could be supervisors and managers and there could be experts from other areas that are associated with what you're focusing on performance wise. Um, so that there, there was be another exercise if we had time, but we don't. So there's a couple of articles here. The URLs are at the bottom of the page. This is about the stakeholders. Uh, this is the article from 95. There's different versions of stakeholder. So don't be fooled that, you know, you got to figure this out in your environment who are all the stakeholders? You know, are we after, you know, societal responsibility? Are we got a government that we got to deal with their laws, regulations, codes, and things like that? Shareholders, of course, we can't spend their money, uh, spend a dollar and get 50 cents back. There's, you know, board of directors, there's customers who lead with requirements, but they don't sit at the top of the hierarchy. If the government says that's against the law, we'll find you, throw you in jail. Doesn't matter what the customer wants. But the customer leads us in terms of what their needs are. And then we've got to contend with all the other uh, stakeholders. Um, so that article explains that. There's a 25 page PDF here on modeling mastery performance, which is what we tried to cover today. And then systematically deriving the enablers for performance, that version of the Ishikawa diagram, my version of it that I showed you way back at the beginning of this thing. 
Here's the 1984 article that was published in the uh, NSPI journal at the time on how to use a group process to create models and matrices. We covered the models in this. And here's the training magazine article from 1984 on building a curriculum architecture design using the kind of data that I've just presented to you today. I've got a book, Lean ISD. It's available as a free PDF on my website, or you can buy a Kindle or a paperback version of it. I've got books from 2011 on the right-hand side. I've got this book from uh, just this past November. Alex Salas was one of the reviewers on this thing. So he reviewed this a book when it was in a draft stage and gave me feedback as with 24 other people and I updated the book. So that goes into the, the the greatest depth on this, and it's the most current of my view on how I do this kind of work. It's really all about performance competence, performing tasks to produce outputs to the stakeholder requirements. So you got to have a way to figure that out. I've got mm -hmm. one way. It works for me. There's many other ways to do this. Thanks for your time today. I'll be happy to hang out and uh, talk about this further uh, with you all, if you can stay. And uh, but, but thank you for your time.